Welcome to Double Portion Inheritance with Maria Marola and Gary Wold, brought to you by DoublePortionInheritance.com. Since 1981, Maria heard the call of Yahuwah to become a watchman to the House of Yisrael and to those within the traditional Christian church. She was instructed to warn them against the false doctrines and pagan traditions of men. After 25 years of studying scripture, the word of Yahuwah came to Maria again in 2007 as she was called out of the corporate world to become a full-time intercessor and prophetic teacher. The name of the ministry, Double Portion Inheritance, was given to her after she received the revelation of the two houses of Israel from Ezekiel 37, 16. The mission of this ministry is to bring together the stick of Judah and the stick of Joseph for the return of the Messiah, Yehushua. And now, Maria Marola. Shabbat Shalom. We are about to embark on part two of Valentine's Day and Nimrod, the original Cupid. Last week, we talked about this creature that in mythology is referred to as Pan or Faunus. And I talked about how Nimrod, of course, was a human being, but it's been suggested, and I believe based on the the scriptures, that he became what's called a chimera, a hybrid human and goat, because he mingled his seed with strange flesh, as it says in Jude chapter 1, verse 7. I have another blog called Discerning the Kingdom of Antichrist. And when you go to that, you'll understand what I mean. It's been said in different writings, different historical writings, that he fled from his pursuers. And this is Pangea before the earth, the continents of the earth were divided after the flood in the days of Peleg. All the continents were connected. And then slowly after the flood, they they drifted apart. But in the days when this was going on, Mesopotamia, which was in Syria and Iran, or Iraq, I should say, was right in this area. And Nimrod could flee over this natural land bridge without needing to cross large bodies of water. And he fled to what's called today is Rome. But in those days, it was called Saturnia. So they named that area called Rome. They named it Saturnia after Nimrod because His name in Chaldean was actually Saturn. You know, I really recommend you go back and watch the part one because I talk about King Nebuchadnezzar's vision of the man with the head of gold and how it represents these different kingdoms, these different empires of history. And I've added some new uh, images since last week. I've added some new images to this blog. And um, this one right here, features some archaeological uh, finds that they found in Turkey. And this is an image of Nimrod shooting his bow. Uh, This is, you know, he's known as a mighty hunter. This is Nimrod killing a lion. Um, This right here is Mount Nemrut in Turkey. Heads, these are heads, you know, different heads of pagan deities. Nimrod is one of them. Um, So this this is real stuff. This isn't just legend. Um, So these are artifacts from ancient Mesopotamia where Nimrod ruled in 23 BC. He was also known as Gilgamesh. Today, these regions are in modern day Iraq and Syria where Abraham was born. Okay, And when Abraham left the land of his fathers in Chaldea, he left behind this pagan religion. Okay, And, you know, this is kind of like a uh, this comes from that movie that was made in 1960 called the bible where they show nimrod shooting his arrow and you know he's got makeup on and you know um that was you know the guy that made that movie uh the bible he you know kind of imagined what nimrod might have looked like you know and so we talked about that this last week and i talked about how there is a miss about Semiramis, Nimrod marrying his own mother named Semiramis. Now, the Bible's silent about this, but there really was a queen, an Assyrian queen named Semuramit. And she believed, you know, all the, all the, uh, all the pharaohs believed that they were a reincarnation of the sun god Ra. The Assyrian kings, they too believed that they were a reincarnation of Nimrod. The sun, you know, they believed Nimrod was the first archetype of the pagan sun deity. He was a mighty 
a king in ancient Babylon. And when he died, people deified him and they believed in reincarnation. So these kings of different empires throughout the ages have believed that they are a reincarnation of Nimrod. And so the Assyrian kings believed that. The Egyptians named Nimrod Osiris. So Osiris is another name for Nimrod. And his son was Horus. Um, in Assyrian, it was Tammuz. And we read that about that in Ezekiel 8.14. The prophet Ezekiel was seen, uh, saw that even the people of Israel, the ancients, were worshiping Tammuz in the temple of Yahuwah. And it was an abomination to Yahuwah. So this Assyrian queen, she held the throne for her young son, Adad Narari III, in the year 811 through 783 BC. So this was much later than Nimrod. Nimrod was around 23 BC. This is like, you know, more than a thousand years later. But here's why people have conflated this idea of Nimrod being married to his mother, Semiramis. Because, like I said, these kings of different empires believed they were reincarnations of Nimrod you know, who took on different names. They believed in reincarnation. So when they speak of Ra, that's Nimrod. When they speak of Osiris, that's Nimrod, you know. And so in this Assyrian time, they believed in Osiris. And her son was King Adad. He was killed in battle. But the legend goes because this is the ancient mystery religion that they believed in, that her son who was killed in battle, you know, he was deified and he's reincarnated. You know, he's he comes back as Nimrod or Tammuz and he impregnates her with the rays of the sun. And so she became pregnant with Tammuz. So that's where that's how the legend goes. So it's not that historically there really was that Nimrod did marry a woman named Semiramis. That's not it. What it is is in the ancient mystery school religions, they claim that Semiramis' son, Adad, who was killed in battle, that when he died, you know, he goes to heaven as this reincarnation of the sun god Nimrod or Osiris, and he impregnates her with the rays of the sun, and then she becomes pregnant with Tammuz. So this is how the myth evolved. So while it's not historically accurate that this actually happened in scripture, this is how the mystery school religions present it. And Yahuwah even talks about it in Ezekiel because he's recognizing that these people are following pagan myths and it's an abomination to him. Okay. So uh, so did Nimrod build the Tower of Babel? Well, I believe that he did, okay? Because right here in Genesis chapter 10, it says, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before Yahuwah. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before Yahuwah. Now the word before, and I explained it last week, the word before means panim, in the face of, like, when, when someone says, oh, you know, this person is like in my face. You know, he's got this in your face type of attitude. That's what it means. Or like to say someone disrespected you right in your face. They didn't even say it behind my back. They had the audacity to do it right in front of me. Right. Exactly. So it says the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erek, and Akkad, and Kelne in the land of Shinar. And out of that land went forth Ashur. Now, Ashur is an ancient name for Assyria. And builded Nineveh. So here it's telling us that Nimrod builded Nineveh and the city of Rehoboth and Kalah and Resin between Nineveh and Kalah, the same as a great city. So he built the kingdom of Babel. And so Ashur or Assyria was in much closer proximity to where the Vatican is now located in Rome before Pangea. Now to travel from, uh, you know, 
Iraq to Rome, you would have to cross the Mediterranean Sea. But in Nimrod's day, there was a natural land bridge. He escaped on foot and his body was, you know, as the legend goes, he died in the city of Saturnia, which today is Rome, the city of Rome. And so in those days, they deified him and called him Baalentine, Baal, Baalentine. But later on, the letter V was incorporated into the Hebrew language and it was Valentine, right? So this means that Nimrod could cross over the natural land bridges on foot from Syria, Iraq, Turkey, into Italy. In Rome at one time, Valentine was Baalentine to commemorate Baal, Baal, the god of sexual desire. Now we can see the connection between Valentine's Day, the papacy, and Mystery Babylon. See, Valentine's Day is another custom that was birthed at the Tower of Babel, which is why the Roman papacy has made St. Valentine's Day an official Roman Catholic holiday. So we should have nothing to do with this an abominable... Um, let me see if I can find... Yeah, I, I added more images to this blog since last week. So I'm just kind of covering... So a few highlights from last week so that you can see these new images that I added to the blog. But last week I talked about the Yule Wheel. There's eight pagan feasts, eight feasts for the beast. And all, all eight of these Catholic holidays were at one time celebrated. Well, they're still celebrated in paganism, in witchcraft, in Wicca. They still celebrate these pagan holidays, you know. Uh, Sawin, Halloween, the Catholic Church calls it. Um... All Saints Day, Yule is De is Christmas, Imbolic, which is Valentine's Day, Ostara, which is Easter, Beltane, you know, May Day, Mayflower, uh, not Mayflower, May Day, you know, where they dance around the Maypole, Summer Solstice, Lugnazad, they believe in the Catholic Church that Mary was uh, bodily resurrected and went to heaven just like our Messiah, which is a lie. She... Um, will won't receive her resurrected body until the rest of us do. In that Valley of the Dry Bones prophecy in Ezekiel, we all will get our new bodies at that time. Mabon, which is uh, the autumn, the autumn equinox. So these eight festivals are from ancient Babylon, but the Catholic Church covered them up to look like Christian holidays. Okay, so let's talk about. Why February 14th? The Ides of the month in paganism, why did they choose uh, February 14th? Well, why should the Romans have chosen February the 15th? You see, the middle of the month uh, in ancient Rome, they consider the Ides of the month, when the moon is at its fullest phase, they consider that the most advantageous time to do spells and omens. So um, on February 15th, which the evening before that would be the 14th, because, you know, even even in before the Gregorian calendar, before Pope Gregory changed the calendar and made midnight the, the beginning of a new date. OK, that was uh, in 1582. Prior to that, everybody in the ancient world knew that a new calendar date changes at evening. So. The Romans um, believed that, you know, at the evening before the 15th, which is the 14th, they believed that's the Ides of the month, the middle of the month. They they gave honor to Lupercus, the Nimrod of the Bible. Well, first of all, it's important to understand that since the creation, a new calendar date changed its sunset the evening before. Nimrod the Baal, or sun god of the ancient pagans, was said to have been born at the winter solstice. In ancient times, the solstice occurred on January 6th, and his birthday, therefore, was celebrated on January 6th. That's why President Trump did that mystery uh, religion ritual at the Capitol Dome on January 6th. People need to understand why. Because Trump was displaying himself as the reincarnation of Nimrod, of Osiris, under the dome. The capital dome is supposed to be the womb of Isis, the womb of Semiramis, the womb of supposedly 
Mary Magdalene. You know, because in the Rosicrucian cult, they believe that Jesus got married to, to Mary Magdalene and that she had a daughter named Sarah, which we know is a complete lie. But they talk about this in that movie called The Da Vinci Code. And if, and if you watch that movie, you'll understand that they're telling us the identity of the anti-Messiah, the false Messiah, is supposed to come out of this royal bloodline, supposedly, of Mary Magdalene and Jesus. They call themselves the Merovingians, of which Trump's family claims to be of that bloodline. In fact, in that movie, The Da Vinci Code, you can see a painting on the wall in the background of, of Trump's mother. Her name is Mary McLeod. That was her maiden name, M.M. Mary McLeod, just like Mary Magdalene. And it's obvious that they're showing us that they are they believe that Trump is the Holy Grail, that you know he's coming, he's coming from that supposed bloodline of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. That's why Trump did that whole thing on January 6th. Because in the Catholic Church, they call that the Feast of the Epiphany, where they claim that that's when the wise men came to Bethlehem to visit the child. But there's no such record of that in Scripture that they came on January the 6th. What it is, is the Catholic Church is trying to assimilate that date, January 6th, to Nimrod. That's what they're trying to do. But unsuspecting Catholics have no idea. So later, as the solstice changed, okay, because after the days of the flood, the earth tilted on its axis by 23 degrees. Now, um, the solstice lands on December, you know, three days after December 25th. Usually the winter solstice is December 21st. Three days later is supposedly when the sun God is reincarnated, when he is reborn, which is called Christmas. So it was a custom of antiquity for the mother of a male child to present herself for purification on the 40th day after the birth of a male child. It says this in Leviticus 12, 2 through 5. The 40th day after January 6th, which was Nimrod's original date of birth, takes us to February the 15th, the celebration of which began on the evening of February the 14th, the Lupercalia, or what they call St. Valentine's Day. Now, on this day in February, Semiramis, the supposed mother of Nimrod. Now, we know in reality, Nimrod wasn't married to Semiramis, but this is how the ancient mystery school religion has, uh, you know, formulated this narrative. That on this day in February, Semiramis, the mother of Nimrod, was said to have been purified and have appeared for the first time in public with her son as the original mother and child. And here you have an image um, with Semiramis holding her mother child. It's really, you know, the Catholic Church put this sculpture there. It's got Mary and baby Jesus. He's holding up his two fingers. For those of you that want to know what those two fingers mean... In Satanism, it's called Solve a Coagula. And you can see the Baphomet images holding up the two fingers on his arm. He's got tattooed Solve a Coagula, which means solution and coagulation. And this is where the whole idea of the Hegelian dialectic comes from. This is why they have presented to us the idea that there's a two-party system in America, and you have to choose between the Republican or the Democrats. But guess what? It doesn't matter. Regardless of what side you choose, you see a cow, and he's trying to decide whether to go to the right or to the left. But regardless of what side he takes, he's going to the slaughterhouse. Okay? So this idea of solve a coagula, solution and coagulation, is this principle in Luciferian religion where they try to make you think you have this choice, but you don't. The Hegelian dialectic is a framework for guiding thoughts and actions into conflicts that lead to synthetic solutions, which can only be introduced once those being manipulated take a side 
that will advance the predetermined agenda. It's called controlled opposition, problem, reaction, solution. And there you have the elephant for the Democratic Party and you've got the donkey for the, uh, no, I meant, I said that wrong. <laughs> the elephant for the Republican Party and the donkey for the Democratic Party. It's, uh, you know, it's an illusion. That, and it was named after this guy named George Hegel. George Hegel is the one who developed this strategy called the Hegelian dialectic. The synthetic solution to these conflicts can't be introduced unless those being manipulated take a side that will advance the predetermined agenda. This is why Yahuwah con convicted me after 9-11 to stop voting. Okay. I don't vote. Okay. I, I did cave in in 2016 and voted for Trump because my husband wanted me to. And he doesn't mind me saying that he's repented since then. Right, honey? <laughs> True that. Uh, vote. Look at the word vote. Let's see what it means in the dictionary. Vote. Okay. From the Latin, a solemn promise to, to take a vow. See, when you vote, you're taking a vow, whether you realize it or not. I know a lot of people are doing this out of ignorance. You're taking a vote to this Luciferian system. Okay? Don't let them manipulate you. Everything's predetermined. They choose. You think that our vote really counts? It doesn't. There's 13 Illuminati families who choose who the next president's going to be. And I definitely believe Trump's coming back. And it's not going to depend on your vote or my vote. It's been determined years and years and years ago. He's been the chosen one by the Merovingian Illuminati bloodline. So anyway, I digressed a little bit because I want you guys to understand what these two fingers represent. The reason why in Catholic artwork, you got Jesus doing the two fingers. It's the same image, you know. Baphomet makes the same exact two fingers because what he's, uh, the two fingers, see, he's doing the two fingers. Why? Because it has to do with solve et coagula. These two principles, it's the black and the white checkerboard floors in Freemasonry. It's the yin and the yang. These two opposites coming together into synthesis. That's why they present to us these two seemingly opposite ideals because they're trying to polarize everybody into these two camps so they can cause division. It's called divide and conquer. They've got black people fighting against white people. They got white people fighting against black people. They got Democrats fighting against Republicans, liberals fighting against conservatives, males against females. They're purposely creating these divisions so they can weaken us. And when they weaken us, they're in control. Don't give in. Don't choose a side. Follow Yahuwah. Don't follow their Hegelian dialectic strategy. So, Sorry, I digress, but I had to explain the two fingers. Okay, Cupid makes his appearance. See, another name for the child Nimrod was Cupid because Cupid means desire. It says this in Encyclopedia Britannica. It is said that when Nimrod's mother saw him, she lusted after him. She desired him. Nimrod became her Cupid and her desired one, and later her valentine. So evil was Nimrod's mother, Semiramis, that she married her own son. And then you have this graphic here, Semiramis, Nimrod, and their baby, Tammuz, who was born at the winter solstice, December 25th. And like I said, where this legend even came from is that the real Semiramis, Samuramit, who was an Assyrian queen, after her son died in battle, they deified him and they told this legend that she married her own son and he impregnated her with the rays of the sun and she gave birth to Tammuz. So it was all a big myth. So they, you know, mystery school religions, this is what they teach. 
So ins inscribed on the monuments of ancient Egypt are inscriptions that Nimrod, who is also called Osiris in the Egyptian culture, that he was the husband of his mother. So this is goes all the way back to Egypt, that he was the husband of his mother. As Nimrod grew up, he became the child hero of many women who desired him. He was their Cupid. In Daniel eleven thirty seven, he is called the desire of women. And this is where people get confused and they say, oh, the Antichrist has to be a homosexual. No, that's a misunderstanding because it says in Daniel eleven thirty seven, 37, he shall not regard the desire of women. So people think that means he's not going to be attracted to women. That's not what it means. It means that the false Messiah will have no regard for any other God, not even Tammuz who, or Cupid, who is called the desire of women. He shall have no regard for any other God because he will worship himself. He will exalt himself above all other gods. That's what it means. And you can certainly see how Trump fits into that. So it has nothing to do with homosexuality. People have misunderstood that verse. That word, desire of women, is just a name for Cupid or Tammuz. Okay? It says he provoked so many women to jealousy that an idol of him was often referred to as the image of jealousy in Ezekiel 8, 5. It is said that when Noah's son Shem had Nimrod killed, all his body parts were chopped off like limbs to a tree, hence he is the God of the Christmas tree, okay? But the only body part of his that was never found was his phallus. I hesitate to actually say the real P word because it's just so, it's just so graphic and, you know. Uh, Nimrod's phallus was then memorialized as what's called an Egyptian obelisk. That's what this is, an Egyptian obelisk, um, this is what the Washington Monument is. It's a powerful occult talisman used to draw satanic power in rituals in the last days. All ten horns, all political powers of the earth will be ruled by one horn. In Daniel's prophecy, it's called the little horn. Okay. Now, I want to say this. This was in um, the year 2020. In September of 2020, there was this huge prayer rally down in Washington, D.C., called The Return. Okay, they called it The Return. And people were standing at this, you know, so-called Christians. I mean, I'm not going to say they weren't real Christians, but maybe some of them were. But out of ignorance, they stood in front of this image and they put their hands on it and they prayed towards this obelisk just like they would do at the Western Wall in Jerusalem. And... They were praying for repentance, but here they are praying unknowingly to this Egyptian obelisk, which they had no idea as Nimrod's private parts, right? And the whole so-called prayer rally, they were all facing the Egyptian obelisk. And the whole thing was about Trump. Oh, Trump's coming back. We're going to pray for him to return. We're going to pray for this country. We're going to pray for the, the country returns and then we bring Trump back. Save us, Trump. Save us. The people didn't even realize that it was all, you know, about Trump worship. And, you know, even Jonathan Kahn, you know, he dresses in all black. And I, and I hate to say this because, I mean, a lot of stuff that Jonathan Kahn says sounds really, really good. I mean, he brings forth a lot of good stuff. And, and it's like it's so hard for me to say these things because it's like, man, it, you know, but look at this. This is a Freemasonic hand sign. And in three different pictures, he's doing the sign where he puts his hand over his beard. And then and you, and you have all these famous Freemasons who do it. That guy that used to be Kramer on Seinfeld, David Wilcock, Sir Francis Dashwood, Paul Revere. They all did this. OK, so here's seven reasons why I'm suspicious he wears only black all the time. This is a hint that he might be he might be a Jesuit or a Zionist. Now, I know in Chabad Lubavitch Judaism, they wear all black. Okay. But he blends Christmas and Hanukkah at his congregation 
I know people that went there in New Jersey, went to his congregation. They mix the two. And we're told not to blend the holy with the profane. Jonathan Kahn knows better. He knows the Torah pretty well. He knows not to blend Christmas with Hanukkah. Um, he quotes from the Zohar and Kabbalah magic. He claimed, and I heard him say this with my own ears. He was on the Jim Baker show. Somebody sent me the YouTube video. I can't find it anymore. But I heard him say this. He claimed that President Trump ushered in a jubilee year in the year 2017 when he made Jerusalem the capital city. I remember that, too. Yeah, but here's the thing. And he actually called Trump the Messiah Ben Joseph. When I heard him say that, I was just freaking out. I thought, this is ridiculous. He's calling Trump the Messiah Ben Joseph? What you have to understand is that many rabbis and sages and scribes saw the Messiah of the Old Testament. They saw two different uh, types of messiahs. And some of them said that he would be like Joseph, the suffering servant. servant. Some of them said he would be like David, the conquering, reigning king. Little did they realize there would be two comings. The first coming, he would be like Joseph, the suffering servant, Messiah ben Joseph. That at his second coming, he would be like David, the conquering, reigning king. But I would point out that neither of those people were arrogant people, Yahusha or David. Exactly. Dawid. I heard Jonathan Kahn say that Joseph, that Trump is the Messiah ben Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to retch. Uh, um, and, and listen, it's the real Messiah who ushered in a jubilee year in Luke chapter four when he says that he came to bring in the acceptable year of Yahuwah. That was a jubilee year. That's that's the terminology they use when it's a jubilee year. Only the high priest is allowed to. Declare that it's a jubilee year. That's why Yahushua came and preached the acceptable year. Because he was displaying himself as the Mashiach. The, the, I'm getting chills as I'm saying this. Like, like I feel such a powerful anointing as I'm saying this. That Messiah Yahushua is the high priest. He's the only one that's allowed to usher in a jubilee year. But here, Jonathan Kahn is claiming that Trump ushered in a jubilee year. Now, here's the other flaw. If what he says is true, now we got to wait till 50 more years from 2017, which is 2067. We'd have to wait till 2067 for the second coming of the real Messiah, because when he returns, he's coming back in another jubilee. How do we know? How do we know that when Messiah comes back, he's coming back in another jubilee? Because it says in Luke chapter 4 that he only read half of Isaiah 61 verse 2. He says that, you know, that he came to preach the acceptable year of Yahuwah. And then he left out the part where it says, and the day of vengeance of our Elohim. Because when he comes back, it's going to be in another jubilee year, and it's going to be on Yom Kippur, and he's coming back on the day of vengeance. So, no, Trump did not usher in a jubilee year. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, there's things, he teaches that we're in a new age of enlightenment. This was in 2019. He did a podcast on the new age of enlightenment. This is a new age concept, a Luciferian concept. So, and I brought all this out because they had this prayer meeting down in Washington, D.C. called The Return. And it was a couple months before the election of 2020. Little did people know what was really going on. Jonathan Kahn was the one leading the whole prayer service. Okay. People don't understand what's going on. Hey, Bo said the, to the uh, corresponding Torah portion that week of that same event was the one about the, the three uh, men not bowing down. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Oh, wow. I'm getting chills. That's amazing. That is. That's, oh, I didn't man. know that. That's amazing. Thanks for bringing that out, though, because I'm, I'm like literally getting chills. I'm feeling the Ruach really powerful. Okay. Um, so all seven continents of the world were connected before the flood. 
And after the flood, that all those seven continents split apart. So all seven continents of the world will be reunited as the ten horns on the beast. It says they will rule for one hour with the beast um, in Revelation 17, 12. You know, it talks about seven kings. I believe those seven kings are the seven rulers over their, those seven continents. And so they're going to come together under the authority of this one horn, the little horn, the one world government. This horn is none other than Satan's political power that will be seen in the phallic symbol of Nimrod, the obelisk. Okay, now picture here is a white horse. A white horse is a, uh, you know, with a, a unicorn. They call this a unicorn. Now, the Bible mentions the word unicorn, but it's not talking about this mythical creature, a white horse with a horn. When the Bible mentions unicorn, it's talking about a rhinoceros. That's what it's really talking about. But this mystical creature that's mentioned in Revelation 6-2 is not to be confused with the King James word unicorn, which is a rhinoceros. We're shown in Revelation 6-2 that the anti-Messiah, the false Messiah, will conquer the world while riding a white horse as he tries to mimic the true Messiah in Revelation 19 as he returns also on a white horse. But the real Messiah has many crowns. The false Messiah only is given one crown. And that was shown to me on March 21st, 2020. And uh, that day was very pivotal for me because I was just not really paying much attention to what was going on with the pandemic. And Yahuwah just spoke to me and said, go look up Revelation 6-2 and read it with new eyes. As I was reading it, he said to me, the rider on that white horse is Trump. And I was stunned because I would have never thought that. But here's what I was shown on that day. And, you know, Trump was selling these digital cards not too long ago of himself riding on a white horse. But I was shown, and I'm not going to say it out loud because YouTube will pick it up. But, yeah, this is the crown was given to him. The word uh, corona means crown, virus, poison, bow, toxin, Revelation 6-2. Um, says that the false messiah is given a bow. And the history of that word is toxon, which means po a poison in which arrows are dipped. And we know he's the one who initiated it with Operation Warp Speed. So this is, uh, you know, every pope claims or believes that he's a reincarnation of Nimrod which is a false messiah. This is why every pope wears the mitre of Dagon. Okay, you see this image. It looks like a fish. This is the ancient priests of Nimrod wore this headdress that looked like a fish. This is why you see all the popes wearing this. And so I made this graphic. It says Nimrod of ancient Babylon was said to have been reincarnated into a giant fish in the Mediterranean Sea. Dagon means fish in Hebrew. And the papacy to this day wears the same Dagon fish miter to show they are portraying the ancient priesthood of Dagon, the fish god. It is said that when Nimrod's body parts were cut off and distributed, he was reincarnated as a giant fish. He lived in the Mediterranean Sea. Mediterranean sea. That's why, you know, in Ezekiel 28, it talks about the prince of Tyre. You see, Tyre is a uh, an area which was near a seaport. It's today called Lebanon. So the Prince of Tyre is said to be the one who was in the Garden of Eden. And at one time he was a covering cherub. And at one time he had this breastplate with all the gemstones in it, just like the high priest. But he was so proud of his beauty that he fell for, because of his arrogance and because of his pride. Now, here I made another graphic showing all the names under which Nimrod is referred to in different mystery schools. But it all goes back to Nimrod because Nimrod's the original archetype. See, in ancient mystery school religions, Nimrod of the Bible was deified as the following pagan gods in the pantheon. You got Pan. Baphomet, Faunus, Eros, Lucifer, Santa Claus, the devil, Satan, the beast, the serpent, Father Christmas, Tumnus from the Narnia films, 
Cernunos, which is named after CERN. Okay, that's Cernunos. So you got all these pagan deities. Neptune, he's the beast coming up out of the sea. You know, Mars, Cupid, Vulcan, Mercury, Pluto, Jupiter, Saturn, Lupercus, Marduk, Zoar, Zoroaster, uh, Maitreya. All these pagan deities, they all stem from the legend of Nimrod and Gilgamesh. Okay, that's where it all comes from. I just want you guys to understand the origins of where these pagan myths developed. So as we can see from the graphic, Nimrod has become the universal god of the pagans. And just as his body parts were scattered throughout the 10 province of, provinces of the land of Shinar, so his mystery religion has been scattered to the nations. Because there was 10 provinces in the land of Shinar. And I believe that this represents the 10 horns on the beast. So let's talk about the connection between the book of Esther and Valentine's Day. Okay. Why do you think Haman shows the, the 13th day of the month of Adar, the 12th month of Adar to kill the Jews? You see, in 1582, the Roman Julian calendar was updated and changed to the Gregorian calendar decreed by Pope Gregory the, uh, let's see, the third, what is it? The 13th? Yeah. He, it was at this point that Pope Gregory caused the new calendar date to change at midnight instead of at sundown and thus changing Yahuwah's rendering of the times and the seasons. He also changed the new year back to January 1st, which was first done by Julius Caesar. But as Christianity began to spread throughout Europe, many Christians began to celebrate the new year on March 25th which was the original date of Easter or Ishtar, because they thought our Messiah, they be, they believed that our Messiah was born on December 25th. So they believed that nine months earlier, he would have been conceived in March. This is where Jonathan Kahn gets the idea where, you know, he teaches that our Messiah was born in April. But, you know, people need to understand, Jonathan Kahn, he's, he's obviously embroiled in all this, you know, mystery school religion stuff. I wouldn't believe him. He's trying to bring us back to the whole April Fool's notion, which I'll explain that. So nine months backwards from March 25th or from December 25th would be March 25th. Little did they realize that this was the conception date of Nimrod and his reincarnated son Tammuz, Ezekiel 8, 14. So in order to manipulate the calendar, so that Easter would fall closer to Yahuwah's Passover, Pope Gregory then changed the New Year back to January 1st in honor of the pagan god Janus. And thus the Catholic Church would be able to assimilate the pagan celebration of Easter to our Messiah's resurrection. Before Pope Gregory changed the New Year to January, uh, which was the 12th month of the year. See, January used to be the 12th month of the year. But February, um, yeah, Pope Gregory changed the new year to January. The 12th, oh, I'm sorry, the 12th month of the year was February. I'm saying this wrong. So before Pope Gregory changed the new year to January, the 12th month of the year was February. The Romans and all other pagan cultures who worshipped Baal in as many different forms believed that the 13th day of the 12th month was a lucky day to call on the pagan deities. So, the wicked Haman plotted to kill Yehuda, Judah, the house of Judah, on the 13th day of the 12th month. Okay, so on the Hebrew calendar, the 12th month of Adar is what we would call February today. So it is no coincidence that the wicked Haman Haman had cast lots to see what day would be the luckiest day of the year to annihilate the Yahudim, the Jewish people, because out of that bloodline came the true Messiah. So why do you think that Haman wanted to destroy all the Jews in Persia? Because he knew that out of that tribe would come the Messiah. 
And so there were lots cast, and the demons gave the answer to Haman through the soothsayers. As seen in the book of Esther, the day that was selected was the 13th day of the 12th month of Adar, and it's in Esther 3.13. The ancient Romans believed that every month had a spirit that gained in strength and reached its peak or its apex of power in the middle or the Ides of the month. This was usually the 15th day, and it was a day when witches and ogres or soothsayers worked their magic. An ogre was a person filled with a spirit of divination, and from the root word ogre, we get the word inaugurate which means to take omens. This is why we should not be participating in the presidential inauguration. Because as, you know, we watched this film a couple years ago, and it's called The Belly of the Beast, and they explain in the in the film this documentary that the that the dome, the Capitol Dome is supposed to be the womb of Isis, And the phallus symbol that's directly across from it is the uh, the phallus of Osiris. And all during the presidential inauguration, there are people, satanic people inside the dome doing rituals. And they're praying for the spirit of Osiris to take hold of the new president who's taking office. Okay, that's what they're doing. So since February had been robbed by the Caesars, it had only 28 days. In leap years, it's 29 days. The Ides of February became the 14th day of that month. See, February used to have 30 days in it, but I'll explain how it became only a 28-day month. So since the Ides of a month was celebrated in the preceding on the preceding eve, The month of February was unique because it was the 13th day that became the eve of the Ides of that month, and it became a very important pagan holiday in the Empire of Rome. This is why Haman, when he cast lots, was shown the 13th day of the 12th month of Adar. Okay, now we know why, because the demons knew the best time to destroy the Yehudi, the Yehudim, the Jews, was on the day of Lupercus, Lupercalia, the day of Nimrod, okay? So the Hebrew month Adar is in February on the Gregorian calendar. The 13th day of the month was their luckiest day when they could beckon the gods to do their bidding, okay? Therefore, if you're a follower of the Messiah of Israel, you should have nothing to do with Valentine's Day on so many levels, because it's the same day that Haman wanted to annihilate the Yahudim in Persia, which are the tribe through which our Messiah came. It's his seed line. Okay. Um, now, this comes from this website, Last Trumpet Ministries. They explain this is Julius Caesar, a bust of Julius Caesar's head. It says, in the days of the Roman Empire, the month of February was the last and shortest month of the year. February originally had 30 days, but when Julius Caesar named the month of July after himself, he decided to make that month longer and shorten February to 29 days while making July a month of 31 days. Because, of course, you know, these guys believe they were a reincarnation of the sun god. Sol, Sol Invictus, the invincible sun. All the Caesars believed they were reincarnations of the sun god like Nimrod. Okay, and so he wanted the the month of July to be one day longer so he could have one extra day to receive worship. And then, of course, later, Octavius Caesar was also known as Augustus, and Octavius is named for the number eight. Okay, Uh, when he came to power, he named the month of August after himself, okay, because that was the eighth month in the year on the Roman calendar. Um, and not to be outdone, he also subtracted a day from February and gave the month of August 31 days. To this very day, it remains that way. So February lost two days. Used to be 30 days, now it's only 28 days. But that's because uh, Augustus Caesar stole one day from February and also Julius Caesar. 
So this was a day, you know, the middle of the month of February then became the 14th. So usually the Ides of the month falls on the 15th day of a month. But in February, the Ides of the month is the 14th day. But the eve of the Ides of the month would be the 13th day. That's why Haman chose the 13th day of the month of Adar. So this was a day that was sacred to the sexual frenzy of the god Juno. This day also honored the Roman gods Lupercus and Faunus, as well as the legendary twin brothers who supposedly founded Rome, Remus and Romulus. These two are said to have been suckled by wolves in a cave on Palatine Hill in Rome. The cave was called Lupercal and was the center of the celebrating on the eve of Lupercalia or February the 14th. On this day, Lupercalia, was, which was named Valentine's Day, the Luperci or priests of Lupercus, dressed in goatskins for a bloody ceremony. The priests of Lupercus, the wolf god, would sacrifice goats and a dog and then smear themselves with blood. How disgusting. The blood of a, a, a goat and a dog mixed together. These priests made red with sacrificial blood would run around Palatine Hill in a wild frenzy while carving a goatskin thong called a februa. That's where the name February comes from. It comes from this goat skin thong that they called a fabrua. And the women would sit all around the hill as the bloody priests would strike them with the goat skin thongs to make them fertile. The young women would then gather uh, into the city with their names put in boxes. These are called love notes. They called them billets. You know, and I can remember in Catholic school when they made us you know, fill out these Valentine Day cards. And we had to assign these cards to different kids in our class. Little did we realize where this tradition came from. The men of Rome would draw a billet and the woman whose name was on it became his sexual partner, his sexual lust partner with whom he would fornicate until the next Lupercalia uh, on February 14th. Thus, February 14th became a day of unbridled sexual lust. The color red was sacred to that day because of the blood and the heart shape that is popular to this day. Now, I don't, I'm not trying to demonize the, the color red because the color red is also used in the temple of Yahuwah to represent the blood of Messiah. So I'm not demonizing the color red. I'm just saying that for the pagans, the, the color red means something different than what it means to us. The heart shape was not a representation of the human heart, uh, which looks nothing like it. This shape represents the human female matrix or opening to the chamber of sacred copulation, which is what they call that in the mystery religions. No wonder the pagans commemorated their hero hunter Nimrod or Baal by sending heart-shaped love tokens to one another on the evening of February 14th as a symbol of him, a symbol of Nimrod, their Cupid. When the Gnostic Catholic Church began to get a foothold in Rome around the 3rd century AD, it actually was more like the 4th century AD, they became known as Valentinians. The Catholic Valentinians retained the sexual license of the festival in what they called angels in nuptial in a nuptial chamber which was also called the Sacrament of Copulation. This was said to be a reenactment of the marriage of Sophia and the Redeemer. Okay, so this is all pagan. As participants of the February 14th ritual began, their sexual sacrament presided over and watched by the priests known as Valentinians. The following literary was spoken. Let the seed of light descend into thy bridal chamber. Receive the bridegroom, open thine arms to embrace him. Behold, grace has des descended upon you. Do you see how closely the devil mimics the real Messiah? The seed of the woman in Genesis 3.15 is talking about our Messiah, but they, Satan knows this and he's closely tried to resemble 
the real Messiah when it comes to the birth of the false Messiah, the anti-Messiah. Okay, let the seed of thy, of light descend into thy bridal chamber. Receive the bridegroom. Open thine arms to embrace him. Behold, grace has descended upon you. It's all satanic, but they borrowed. You know, Satan borrows. He's not a creator. He doesn't know how to create anything from scratch. All he knows how to do is borrow and tries to mimic the real Messiah because he wants to trade places with him. He wants to be him. And he tries to convince humanity that he's the real Messiah. So as time went on, the Orthodox Church suppressed the Gnostic Catholics and manufactured St. Valentine, whose day continues to be celebrated in these modern times. It should be without saying that followers of Messiah should avoid Valentine's Day like the plague. In the eyes of our creator, Yahuwah, it is still Lupercalia, the day of the wolf. Men became wolves as they carried on the satanic rituals of fornication which means sexual intercourse without marriage. We have heard of the wolf whistle, and we all know that wolves do not whistle. It represents lustful men and women who carry on Satan's blasphemy to this very day in the rituals of paganism. Then I've got a, uh, a website here, a URL, where you can see this um, article from Last Trumpet Ministries. All right, so... The silence of the educators, teachers in school are often silent about the origin of the customs they are forced to teach in today's schools. If they were to speak out, many people would lose their jobs. Okay, what were you going to say, honey? You're going to say something? Okay. Today, candy makers unload tons of heart-shaped red boxes for February 14th, while millions of the younger generation are annually exchanging Valentine's florists consider February 14th one of their best business days and young lovers pair off at least for a dance or two at St. Valentine's balls. Where did these customs originate? Well, we already know because I shared them with you. Um, let's see here. It was not until the reign of Pope Gelasius that the holiday uh, Valentine's Day became a so-called Christian cup, uh, custom. As far back as 496, Pope Gelasius changed Lupercalia on February 15th to St. Valentine's Day on February 14th. This comes from uh, a book called Customs and Holidays Around the World by Lavinia Dobler, page 172. But how did this pagan festival acquire the name St. Valentine's Day? And why is this little naked cupid of the Pagan Romans so often associated today with February 14th. Why do little children and young people still cut out hearts and send them on a day in honor of Lupercus, the hunter of wolves? Why have we supposed these pagan customs in honor of a false god are Christian? Okay. Um, the Greeks called him Pan. The Semites called him Baal. According to classical dictionaries, Baal so often in the Bible mentioned was merely another name for Nimrod, the mighty hunter. Genesis 10, 9, the hunter Nimrod was the Lupercus or the wolf hunter of the Romans. And St. Valentine's Day was originally a day set aside by the pagans in his honor. Okay. Um, the word Valentine comes from another Latin word, Valentinus, which is a proper name derived from the word valens, which means to be strong, declares Webster's unabridged dictionary. It means literally strong, powerful, mighty. Do you think there's a connection with Nimrod being the mighty hunter? Hmm. It was a common proverb of ancient times that Nimrod was the mighty hunter. Okay. Nian Nimrod was a hero. He was their strong man. He was their valentine. Um, so another one of Nimrod's names in Latin is Sanctus, uh, or Santa or Saint. It was a common title for any hero God in ancient Rome to be called a saint. Roman Lupercalius, Lupercalia was called Saint Valentine's Day. Um, but why do we associate hearts on, in honor of Nimrod or Baal? Well, like I said, the heart is supposed to be the womb, the matrix. That's really what it means. 
and the the heathens worship the womb of uh you know this cult called the Rosicrucians they worship the womb of Mary Magdalene they believe Jesus copulated in there and therefore her womb is called the holy grail this is you know this is all detailed in that movie the da vinci code okay so there was a guy named St. Valentine who was depicted by a boy bishop who was martyred martyred on February the 14th, 278 AD. This illustration comes from Eleanor Fortescue Brickdale in Old English Songs and Ballads. And, you know, apparently this is what the Catholic Church concocted so people would feel like they weren't celebrating something pagan, but they're honoring a Catholic bishop of the church on February 14th, who was martyred, but it's still pagan. You can see that he's still wearing the, the Dagon fish hat worn by the pagan priests of Nimrod. So it says here on February 14th, around the year 2270 AD, Valentine, a priest in Rome, in the days of the emperor Claudius II, was executed. Under the rule of Claudius the Cruel, Rome was involved in many unpopular and bloody campaigns. The emperor had to maintain a strong army, but was having a difficult time getting soldiers to join his military leagues. Claudius believed that Roman men were unwilling to join the army because of their strong attachment to their wives and their families. To get rid of the problem, Claudius banned all marriages and engagements in Rome. See, this is why the Apostle Shaul or Paul talked about this in 1 Timothy chapter 4. He said that in the latter days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, forbidding marriage, okay, and forbidding the eating of meat. He's talking about clean animals, not unclean animals, right? Because Rome has been famous for enforcing this celibacy vow on the priesthood. But Claudius also banned marriages because he didn't want his soldiers to be attached romantically. Valentine, realizing the injustice of the decree, he defied Claudius and continued to perform marriages for young lovers in secret. When Valentine's actions were discovered, Claudius ordered that he be put to death. Valentine was arrested and dragged before the prefect of Rome who condemned him to be beaten to death with clubs and to have his head cut off. The sentence was carried out on February the 14th on or about the year 270. Okay, so this is where a lot of Catholics think that they're celebrating this guy. The Catholic Church did a great job in covering it up. To, but here's the thing. The scriptures say we're supposed to honor saints. No, it says right here in John 5, 41, I receive not honor of men. In John 5, 44, it says, how can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that comes from Elohim only? So no place in scripture are we told to honor saints like the Catholic Church has All Saints Day, which is the eve of Halloween. Or the eve, you know, the evening, uh, you know, yeah, October 31st, the next day, November 1st, they call it All Saints Day when they believe that the, there's the thinnest line between the natural world and the supernatural world, the realm of the dead. So this is nothing more than a, a tradition of men. And what did our Messiah say in Matthew 15, 3? He says, Why do you transgress the commandment of Elohim by your tradition? In verse 6, he says, Thus have you made the commandment of Elohim of none effect by your tradition. In Mark 7, 9, he, he repeats it again and says, Full well, you reject the commandment of Elohim that you may keep your own tradition. Now, you know what's interesting about that? Unfortunately, so many anti-Semitic people mm -hmm. or people, maybe Hebrew roots, who have allowed themselves to be swayed that oh, all, this, all the Jews are of the synagogue of Satan. You know, while this might might have been directed directly by Messiah about some of the uh, Yehudim in his day, like so much scripture, this is true throughout history. This applies to anyone doing it, right? So 
It doesn't matter whether it's the Catholic Church or whether it's the Christian Church today. If you're doing your thing in place of Yahuwah's thing, right. it's inappropriate. Well, here's the other thing to be aware of. In the days when Messiah was here, the priests were chosen by Rome. And, you know, Caiaphas, who was a high priest, he was selected by Rome. He wasn't a true uh, anointed priest of Yahuwah. That's not saying that all all of the priesthood were chosen. Clearly, there's Nicodemus. He was good, but, you know. Yeah, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, they were righteous Pharisees. But the high priest was selected by Rome. Caiaphas was an Edomite. He was not a true Israelite. Yeah, it was a bought and implanted office. So there you go, the Roman influence again, right? Um, and so Messiah said it right here in Mark seven thirteen, making the word of Elohim of none effect through your tradition. So in conclusion, we must ask ourselves, should a true follower of the Messiah be associated in any way with this celebration of evil roots? Should we be doing what the heathen have done for so many years and try to justify it as love? Isn't that what we hear all the time right now in this culture that we live in? Oh, love is love. You know, they say that regarding the whole, you know. Anything goes. Yeah, exactly. You know, I don't even want to say the word because, you know, how YouTube tries to take your video down over stupid things that they don't agree with. Romans 12 says, and be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you may have a hard time giving up this holiday. You may even rationalize, well, we can turn this into a day to celebrate the love of Messiah, right? Well, this might sound logical, but listen to what the Apostle Shaul wrote concerning man-made traditions. Colossians 2.8, he says, Beware, lest any man spoil, spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not after Mashiach. And finally, we're exhorted by the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 10, 2, he says, Thus says Yahuwah, learn not the ways of the heathen and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. See, it's about time that we examine these foolish customs of the pagans, how now and falsely they are labeled as Roman Catholic religion holidays, the Protestant church has followed through and kept the same holidays. It's time that we quit this Roman and Babylonian foolishness. It's idolatry. Let's stop teaching our children these pagan customs in memory of Nimrod, the pagan sun god. And just to follow up on something you said, mm -hmm. I, I've said this for many years now. Recycling is great when you're talking about scarce resources that don't have to do with Yahuwah that are, you know, or aluminum whatever <laughs> recycling is disgusting to Yahuwah right in terms of something that was once pagan and then saying well we're just going to shift it we're just going to relabel it we're just going to change some of the things and turn it into a Yahuwah thing well that's not what Yahuwah had Moses do at the golden calf right he had them grind up the gold to the finest particles they possibly could and drink it of those who are suspected of being guilty of this fornication, this false worship of a calf. Mm -hmm. And those who are guilty, it was a death sentence to them and they died. And the rest of it, you know, those innocent didn't die. And the rest of it was flushed down the stream from the rock. Mm -hmm. It was thrown away. It was utterly destroyed. He wants no part of your pagan traditions. Exactly. Very good, honey. Very good. Summary there. Okay, so Valentine's Day is just another one of these feasts for the beast. You know, I call all eight pagan holidays feasts for the beast. Uh, they're meant to condition the entire world into accepting the final man of sin in the last days, although it is celebrated under the false pretense that it's all about love, just like Christmas. It's just another pagan holiday meant to give honor to Satan through his visible image, which is Nimrod. You know, you know, Yahuwah has a visible image. His visible image is Yahushua. But Satan's visible image has been starting with Nimrod. He was the archetype and all these other pagan de deities, part of the pantheon. And so Valentine's Day, when you're 
uh, you know, sending your children off to school with Valentine's Day cookies and cupcakes, and you're having your children filling out these cards, to do so, consider the fact that to do so, you are paying homage to this creature in his many different aliases, Nimrod, Baal, Pan, Lupercus, Saturn, Santa, Saint, Satan. That's that's what this holiday was all about. It's what it's always been about. I hope you understand that we must be holy as he is holy. And especially now we are in the last days. If you want to be the bride, you must uh, remove those filthy garments and be ready to meet the bridegroom in uh, white robes of righteousness, having your lamps filled with oil, the oil of his name. All right, so that concludes part two of this teaching. Shabbat Shalom. You who will bless you and keep you, you who will make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you, you who will lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. We hope you've enjoyed today's broadcast and that you are encouraged in your walk with Messiah. For more teachings, subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell to be notified of our latest content. Visit Maria's many blogs at doubleportioninheritance.com. That's doubleportioninheritance.com. This ministry is made possible by the prayers and support of listeners like you. To make a donation by PayPal or Venmo.com, use the email address doubleportioninheritance at gmail.com. That's doubleportioninheritance at gmail.com. On behalf of Maria and Gary at Double Portion Inheritance Ministries, May Yahuwah bless you.